Welcome everybody, students, faculty, outsider, artists, communicators, whatever you be, husbands, wives, mistresses, lovers, thank you for coming. Um, this is the second of a whole series of events that we're now holding in our new space for those of you who haven't seen it. We call it the big room. Um, it is a place that we gather for discussion, talk, feedback about the nature of the lens and screen arts, and uh, a place that we're opening up to all kinds of public use and other, other people who want to do things here. So please enjoy it. We, this is the largest crowd we've had yet, and we have a few little kinks probably, so bear with us. It just got finished literally last week in terms of all of its operations. Um, this event is being live streamed all over the world. <laughs> it is a major event, and in cooperation with other institutions, which Marvin will tell you about. And it is available through our website in the future, if you're somewhere else and you want to tune in, so do so. At any rate, uh, I'm happy to have two of my dear colleagues, friends, and compatriots here at the table. I'm being Charlie Rose now. And um, I'll just give a little bit of an introduction. Marvin is one of the founding members of this faculty, now 27 years here and known as a curator, writer, thinker, interlocutor, creative person in our field, uh, longstanding, and uh, at 39, he's done an awful lot. So then Steele, who's going to be our interlocutor tonight, is also an artist, faculty member. How many years have you been here? Eight? I don't think quite that many. Close. Getting there and uh, teaches one of our thesis classes, and is a writer, creator, artist, photographer, and he is an editor of Art in America. So with no further ado, well, a contributing editor, but a regular contributing editor, that makes you an editor. So, here. Thank you both. Thank you, Charlie. If I put this back in here, then I won't have to think about it again. Can you hear me? Yep, hopefully. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction, and then actually Marvin is going to do a lot of this, a lot of the work today. Um, I'm just going to um, stage manage or something. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit of an intro that I have. Um, so we're here today with Marvin Heiferman, who most of you know, who is going to introduce us to his new project, Seeing Science, which launched as a website last month under the auspices of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. It will ultimately also become a book. Seeing Science explores the parallel histories and uses of science and photography. It focuses on the central and evolving role that photography and lens-based technologies play in defining, shaping, promoting, and furthering science, as well as on how images made in and about the sciences impact public opinion and policy, science education, and the news. One of the wonderful coincidences that Marvin discovered in his research is that the word scientist was first coined in 1834. Incredible as that that sounds, certainly science as a word must have been around a lot, a lot, uh, a lot longer than that. Um, but scientist was first coined in 1834, just five years before the word photography itself was first publicly recorded. Indeed, science and photography have developed so inextricably in the modern era that it seems almost too obvious to say that we now live in a world that is a result of their union. Marvin is an independent curator and writer, as Charlie said, he organizes projects about photography and visual culture for institutions that include the Museum of Modern Art, the Smithsonian Institution, the International Center of Photography, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Carnegie Museum of Art, and the New Museum. Earlier in his career as a gallerist and artist representative, notably at Castelli Graphics, which I think is where we first met, um, Marvin worked closely with many artists and photographers, including, among others, Robert Adams, Eve Arnold, Louis Baltz, Nan Golden, Peter Hujar, and Richard Prince. 
He has written essays for many museum and gallery catalogs, as well as for publications and blogs that include the New York Times, CNN, Art Forum, Design Observer, Aperture, Art in America, and BOM. He is the author of over two dozen books on photography and visual culture, including Photography Changes Everything, published by Aperture in 2012, which also began, like Seeing Science, um, as a web project and was, in a sense, its precursor. He's a visiting scholar at the Center for Art, Design, and Visual Culture at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, a core faculty member in the ICP BARD MFA program in Advanced Photographic Studies, and on the faculty here at SVA. Marvin also has an ongoing Twitter and Facebook-based project updated daily called Why We Look, which is actually also on the Seeing Science website, which tracks breaking news stories about imaging and visual culture. Um, before getting into Seeing Science, I've asked Marvin to, to give us a quick tour through his own professional background and history, to give us a sense of the ideas and institutional forms and formats that led up to Seeing Science. Please uh, welcome Marvin. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, some of you know me, some of you don't. So you, some of the slides that you'll see may be of things that you've seen before. So bear with me if that's the case. But I um, just wanted to walk you through a little bit of history of some curatorial projects that I did that kind of set the current projects I'm doing now. Anyway, the Smithsonian thing, the gig stopped, right? I mean, they, the photography initiative got folded into another part of the Smithsonian and I was kind of cut loose. And at that point, I had also done a blog for the Smithsonian and gotten used to having a kind of pulpit and a place to talk about imaging from an audience. And so I started this Why We Look project, which uh, every day, basically, at the end of every day, I spent about 45 minutes looking around on the web for stories about photography and visual culture and pick out the three best ones and tweet them out the next day and it goes to Facebook. And it was, a, for me, also another way to investigate all the various kinds of photographic images that are in the world and, again, built a very different kind of audience. And based on that, and the Smithsonian Project, I do projects with a number of places. I was a consultant at the Carnegie Museum for the startup of the Hillman Photography Initiative where they're trying to rethink photography. If you um, look at most art museums, they all pretty much do the same thing because they're all copying what MoMA did 40 years ago. But some museums are trying uh, more than others to rethink how photography is being uh, dealt with in, in institutions. And so, um, as a freelance person, I've got to make a living, and because it's not from teaching here that <laughs> that I do it, wow. so um, it helps, but it's not from it. So I'm always pitching projects to people, and people are coming to me and saying, "Hey, do you want to do stuff?" And the Smithsonian project, and the conversation I was having, conversations I was having with people in the sciences, made me want to do more of it. And so I, the Paradise Now show, had traveled to the University of. Maryland, Baltimore County, and I am familiar with, and in fact, live with the curator of the Center of Design and Visual Culture there, my husband, so I know everybody down there. So I had an in and was able to propose an idea to them, which was this university, which is now list, considered one of the, it's the, like in the top five innovative universities in the country, right? following MIT and Stanford. Right? It's a fantastic school, but it's a very heavy science school, very heavy on the sciences. They've got a big humanities division, they've got a big arts division, and they're always talking about how to bridge those divisions, how to get people talking to each other across disciplines. So I said, let's do a project about photography and the sciences and see what happens. And so that's how uh, this project uh, began. It's, I've been working on it for two years before now, and it, we're looking at all sorts of things. So I'll, I'll show you the website really briefly before Steele and I talk. But I, I started putting together a timeline of photography and, uh, and the sciences, which nobody's done as extensively as this. So it goes back to what people believe is the first lens. This is from 1000 BC, and it's called the Nimrod lens, and people think it was used to start fires, right? Um, but I also wanted to investigate 
how imaging works in culture in all ways. And so we're going to be looking at everything from science fiction and how science fiction represents imaging to obvious things like NASA and Apollo photographs, you know, on the surface of the moon. This is a photograph, for example, of what a piece of a photographic emulsion looks like. That is the photographic print seen through a microscope at a high magnification. And I've been reaching out to a lot of people now who are doing projects on the sciences. And so um, this is by Daniel Steer, who's uh, an artist whose work is featured on the website now. So I just want to walk you through the website a little bit. OK, so this is the website for Seeing Science. And my plan is for the year, the same way I did at the Smithsonian Project, to develop content um, on this. And then we'll do a publication uh, next year. So the, it's got a number of components. And we just went live last month. So um, we're growing content daily on this. And you know, I advise you to go take a look at it. But the timeline that I mentioned, is an illustrated timeline and has multiple entries that you can just kind of scroll along. Um, and it goes from the earliest entries to, uh, to the latest, right? Tracks, tracks science as science and imaging as they relate to each other. And there's really amazing stories in there. Just researching this, you know, I found the photograph that made Albert Einstein famous, which is something. I didn't know about. He talked about his general theory of relativity, and nobody believed him. It was around the time of World War I. He was a Jew. There was a war. Um, nobody was paying attention to it. But it wasn't until a solar eclipse that scientists made photographs of light around the sun during a solar eclipse that it proved that Einstein was right. The images appeared on the front pages of newspapers all around the world. And overnight, he was famous because of photography. Um, mini exhibitions is an aspect of the project. That I would show you if I could. <laughs> uh, here we go. Every, I decided I wanted to do something similar to what we had done at Exit Art and feature a lot of artists, but I wanted to do it in a way that made sense on the web. So every week, pretty much, we do mini exhibitions. This is Daniel Steer's mini exhibition, who I mentioned. So I'm kind of reaching out to people, and I'm saying, let's just pick five pictures, right? Let's just take five pictures from your work and insert it into this dialogue about photography and science. So this is. Daniel Steers, five pictures, and you basically they're slideshows that kind of run through images. And he's been photographing scientists in their laboratories and then going back to his studio and making pictures that seem to relate to it somehow. So we're running the gamut of 21st century work, 20th century work. This is work Lynn Casabon. Oops, no, it's not. This is James Ball who did these fantastic pictures of early computers that I saw in Wired. And this is me going, looking at things through you know, online, through any kind of sources I can uh, to, to get things for this. But Lynn Casabon is, uh, did a fantastic piece called Uncultivated, where she's photographing weeds in locations and then takes photographs of them and puts them up on billboards and, and uh, bus shelters and have QR codes so people can learn about the plants that are growing literally right under their feet at any point. So as I said, each week we do another exhibition, and they go back in history to the 19th that's, century. That's all the historical ones are great. Yeah, they're really. Come on. <laughs> stop, stop, stop. Habit. Here we go. Okay, so there's snapshots here from Peter Cohen's collection. Right, this is going to go high and low in terms of images. These are images. Right, if you can see those quickly. These are photographs by Carl Strua, who was a artist and textile designer who got really, really interested in microphotography and made gorgeous pictures. You got drop dead, beautiful pictures. Now, these are in the 1920s. And then, you know, we've got things like Rauschenberg's Stone Moon series, 
Lewis Baltz's sites of technology from the late 80s, early 90s, and we'll do historic images like Atkins, who was making cyanotypes. She's the f first woman photographer, and she is the first, or, pe or so people think, and this is perhaps one of the earliest photographic books from uh, 1853. So, this gives you an idea of that. Um, picturing science, short essays, every month we're commissioning an essay. Um, so far, I wrote the one for this month that's kind of about the project. The previous one was by Marcel La Follette, who wrote about a photograph that changed the world, right, which was the photograph of the structure of DNA. This was taken by Rosalind Franklin in 1952 or 53. Three is called Photograph 51, and she took this picture. It's an X-ray um, image of DNA, and she showed it to her colleagues, two of them being James Watson and, and James Crick, who, looking at this picture, were in, able to intuit the three-dimensional yeah, helical yeah. shape right, of DNA. And so she didn't get credit for it. They did, and it's one of the interesting stories in photography. Um, and we'll be doing more uh, more essays coming up. Next is quick look at one of my favorite parts of the website, which is a year-long artist project that we're doing with Oliver Wasso, who's over here, and we'll be talking a couple of weeks about this. And Oliver has a really, really interesting uh, practice in that he's always looking at images in social media and online. And because there are so many science images online, I asked him to do a new collection of images every week on topics of interest to him. So this is this week's uh, group of images about magic lanterns, right? This was last week's bunch of pictures about scientists looking at, uh, tet, you know, at beakers. This is like, you know, smiling women eating salads kind of meme, right? <laughs> the week before was about eugenics, which is a topic that we will certainly get around to at the website. Headgear, so it's looking at science as it's been depicted in the past and in the present, and it's a fantastic uh, project. And then Why We Look is a kind of continuation of my online uh, project. We're basically, I'm linking to news stories. So this week's, the, the last two stories were this Hubble photograph, which is an extraordinary story, right, about how this photograph got made, which shows a zillion galaxies, which is probably going to take too long to load. There it is. It's the story of how this got made. This is basically the Hubble telescope being turned on to look at nothing, right? And so what they realized when they were looking at nothing was there was lots of stuff in nothing. And so this is a section of the sky that is probably the equivalent of looking at a window in an apartment house through five blocks away from here. And in this space, every one of those lights, every one of those sources of light is a galaxy, right? It's like this mind-blowing picture about how science works and how imaging transforms science. This was a picture last week that I thought was hilarious. This was a, a story about how, this is a woman who's portrayed Marie Curie in, I think it was in a movie or a TV show, and that p image of her as Marie Curie has become so popular that it's confused with pictures of Marie Curie. And so now this is the photograph that appears on stamps, and this is the photograph that's appearing in textbooks when people write about Marie Curie. So that gives you, a sense of the project, and 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 uh, you know, feel free to take a look at it whenever you like. We're, as I said, we're going to be building content all the time. We're very active now on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, and we'll be letting people know about what we're doing as it happens. Thank you, Marvin. It's really great to see. It's hard to know if this is on. It's really just great to see what an encyclopedia it is or what a massive amount of research must go into it. And I mean, maybe you could just talk a little bit about that to begin with. I mean, the, the idea that, I mean, you're really compiling all of this pretty much on your own. It's just you and you have, what, you have somebody who helps you with the architecture of the site a little bit? Or maybe just yeah. talk a little bit about what the mechanics of actually it's um, it's an interesting project. When I when I talked to people at the university about it, they said great, and everybody 
said, go do it. And then we had to kind of raise a little bit of money for it. But there's not much money for it. I get paid through the office of the vice president for scientific research at the university, which is an interesting um, thing. And we, you know, basically they said, go find a WordPress site and tweak it. And we did, right? So I've got somebody who we can call up if something goes wrong. And I have a graduate student assistant who works on it half a day a week. But basically this is me looking around for two years trying to figure this out and then setting up a system um, where it works and there's content. I mean, in a funny way, it's as though you become the website before the website becomes the website. I mean, you sort of yes. collect and gather all this information yeah. and then, you know, it's like, and how, how do you even keep it straight or how, I mean, did, I mean, there's a sense in which it's an encyclopedia or perhaps like a, a, a portal to an encyclopedia. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. How do you, how do you organize that even? I, well, I felt when I mentioned, bef when I talked a little bit before about how museums handle photography, there have been a number of museum exhibitions, big museum exhibitions and really good ones about photography and science, but they're all the same exhibition, basically. They're all, let's look at like these fantastic 19th century photographs, right? And then let's look at how 20th century and 21st century artists like riff off of them, right? And what I found in my conversations with scientists, like sitting around at the Smithsonian with the guy who was the head of the Smithsonian uh, Harvard University Observatory, right? And he's talking about how beautiful photographs are. And there's a woman in the room who's from the CIA, right? Whose job is to track drug dealers by looking at aerial thermographic photographs. And she's saying how cool those pictures are. So you realize like, these people thinking f that pictures are interesting for lots of different reasons, and museums don't, because they're, everyone is so heavily invested in the art part of photography in art museums, they're reluctant to do shows like this. John Sarkowski did a show in the early 1960s um, about science photography, and that was kind of it. And as I said, there's been lots of shows about it, so I thought let's let's step back from this and based on the experience I had doing the Smithsonian project which totally changed the way I thought about photography and the way I worked as a curator and as a writer and thinker about this I thought let's just do this let's look at let's look at snapshots about scientific things let's look at the pictures that scientists make let's look at portraits of scientists and see how those go out in the world this week is nobel peace prize week every day there's a picture of a scientist in the newspaper but how are they represented why do they always look so serious you know um, what's that about let's look at scientists in movies let's look at frankenstein let's look at the, the idea of the mad scientist. Let's look at why women scientists are not represented, right? There's a, a, there's a thing called the Matilda um, effect. And it was all about the fact that women scientists were never depicted. So when I was at the Smithsonian, um, some people there started going through the Smithsonian's websites and starting finding photographic portraits of women scientists who they didn't know who they were and started putting them up online and getting attributions and names for them. So, the, so it became this big encyclopedic thing. Why Matilda, I'm just curious. It was named after a scientist whose first name was Matilda, who I mean, became visible, I guess, you know, through this. I mean, it, it really is, this is something that we talk about a lot in this department, you know, we talk about with our students here, especially this notion that, that uh, photographic or yeah, lens-based images seen through the lens of art it winds up being a fairly reductive way of thinking about them, that there's so much information embedded in imagery that gets lost if we're just talking in sort of historical, formal terms, the way a museum might, or the way a museum might catalog. And it seems like in, in a way this project kind of turns that completely on its head because the, the idea is not to sort of close down images by in a sense putting this aesthetic, I don't know, mantle over them, but to figure out how to kind of open them up or, or to pr provide them in a way that um, other viewers can continue to sort of open them up into the worlds that they originally represented. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. And I, I also think it's an interesting time to be doing this. I think 
I, maybe a couple decades ago, scientific imaging seemed very rarefied. But when you go to people's homes and there's sonograms on the refrigerator, right, and everybody's you know getting X-rayed, and everybody and, and you know Hubble, um, you know, puts out images that become wildly popular, right, and go viral, right, and they're aware of it, right. You realize that scientific imaging a different kind of role in culture when you look at the talk about climate change and look at how photography is central to showing people what's happening around the globe, right? Around the planet, that's a completely interesting thing too. And and as we're all, you know, walking around with phones and have all this imaging technology with us, I think we're also more comfortable with technology. So what seemed like it was some other field's way of looking at the world and picture making becomes more and more of our world. I mean, I'm like fascinated to see ads for Samsung refrigerators that have cameras in them, right? So they're taking pictures of the three shelves in your refrigerator that you can see on your phone, right? So or of us as we're opening, going in for the ice cream. Or, sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm com completely fascinated yeah. by surveillance, right? Yeah. And, and I'm completely fascinated by artificial intelligence. And when you think about self-driving cars, right, and the fact that the the AI is in fact based on photographic images somewhere, and I've never I didn't save the link and I can't find it, but I once read that you know cars er, early AI and self-driving car technology was based on four million photographs, still photographs that were you know teaching this technology what's a pedestrian, what's a fire hydrant, what's a bus, what's a What's a traffic light? So this is happening all the time, and at the same time, our relationship to images is a lot less precious. And so the same way that Hubble scientists will add color to a black and white picture to make it vivid and look spectacular, you know, we're doing it to our Instagram pictures. So I think it's an interesting kind of image culture. Well, actually, that's something I wanted you to talk more about, because in one of the your many essays, the one that you just posted recently, talk about the idea of objectivity sort of both in science and or and, and I guess in a sense truthfulness in science and photography and how yeah for so much of its history for photography needed to preserve or felt it needed to be preserved or be judged on the basis of its indexicality or you know some kind of a one-to-one -one sort of truthfulness quotient and science and photography are have now both have turned both of those things on their head, right? That what constitutes truth isn't necessarily a mechanical link. But what's, right. yeah, right. maybe you could just expand there's, on that. There's the a lot of interesting there. writing on that. There's a book called Objectivity that kind of outlines the, the thinking around this in, in the early centuries of science, right? As scientists looked at things and tried to represent them, they had to rely on drawing, right? And basically, scientists could draw things themselves or they could work with artists, right? And it was called like four eye research, right? You have the two eyes of the scientist and the two eyes of the artist making the images. And the goal was quite objectivity, right? But truth to nature, which is why when you look at early horticultural illustrations, you'll see plant in all four seasons in one picture, right? You'll show a branch that has flowers on it and then leaves on it, and then there'll be a branch that doesn't. And then once photography got introduced, all of a sudden there's this, this passive observation. Science is all about observation, right? And so the best observation is the one that's least influenced by subjectivity and emotion and whatever. And so photography represented a huge breakthrough for the sciences. And then that worked, you know, for a while. You think, look at things like Moybridge, or you look at, uh, you know, all, all sorts of uh, imaging in all kinds of ways. And then we're at a point now where objectivity is understood maybe not to be the best way to look at images, where people started coloring science images to make them more readable, right? Or taking, you know, the Hubble pictures or combinations of infrared regular photographs and ultraviolet, you know, they were like multiple cameras combining into one. So this notion is now that photography is this flexible tool for the sciences the same way it is for us, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, did this, this kind of, um, the idea of amplification in science uh, or in, in, in science photography, did that precede the digital? I mean, we sort of think now that that's the digital era is where that 
where life really changed in photography. And that's often a kind of myth, too, because there was so much work that was being done in dark rooms going back really right. since the beginning of photographic time. Right. No, I think they're hand in hand, and I th and it was usually controversial because if somebody, so much of so much of science is about communicating through photographs. And the Smithsonian Project in photography changes everything. One of the really neat um, examples was a daguerreotype of a light spectrum that was sent by an American scientist photographer to his colleague in England in the eighteen. 50s, right? Mm -hmm. So science uses imaging to, you know, scientists communicate with each other through imaging. And when people started publishing p their papers in scientific journals and started altering pictures, all hell broke loose because then there goes the objectivity. And the question was the same way, the same kind of issues that are dogging photojournalism now happened in science probably 15, 20 years ago. Um. Yeah, in, in a minute, actually, I think we'd like to open it up to have some audience uh, questions. But I just have one question maybe before we do that goes back to how the website was made and then how it was launched. I mean, the um, uh, Photography Changes Everything was this site that you said really wasn't, I mean, it was seen by a lot of people, but how did it get seen? And then how, I mean, how, how does that kind of, yeah, social media, virality, I mean, Obviously, you're thinking about that now as you launch this. I mean, how to get eyeballs on it. Is, how do you think about that and the, the problem of, in a sense, bringing in a public or identifying publics? I, I think it's no different than what a lot of people in this room go through when you make work and you want to get it out in the world, right? Yeah. So make a website, and then you got to get people to go to your website and look at it. And yeah, what I, what I found with photography changes everything was if somebody went there once, maybe they won't go back again. So how do you do that? And then even in working with PR people, you can't get newspapers and magazines or what is left of newspapers and magazines to write about something that's not an event. This is not a museum exhibition. We're not saying, like, go to this corner and walk in the door and you're going to see this. We're saying... Go find this and think about it and then come back and do some more. So all of a sudden we realized that social media was essential right, to this. And so we started a really active kind of outreach on Twitter and, and Instagram and, and we'll just we'll spread the word. But what's interesting is that I think it's the right time for this project. You know, I think as I was saying before, I think people are interested in science. I think we're at a point in you know, culture where where everybody realizes the stakes are really, really, really high, and that this is not something that you can't pay attention to. Right, where we live in a world of science, basically. Yeah, right. and revel in it, and are afraid of it, and love it, and mm -hmm. so part of what I wanted the site to do was, you know, get to it. Again, you know, museum shows were always very reverential about it. This has a sense of humor about it, too. I mean, is it possible that your audience, that you know, because surely you'll be hearing from people as they kind of, you know, message in, message back at you. Is it possible that that information may get incorporated? I mean, I could almost imagine yeah. a sort of snowballing effect. For I'm afraid of it. Yeah, I'm afraid that could build happen. build a whole institution yeah, 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 or get them to pay for no, it. No, I'm terrified. There right. are days that I wake up and think, oh, what if this works, right? It's <laughs> like, because it, it's, it's, that's what right. the special projects thing is up there. You know, so from UMBC, we're reaching out and doing a project with a local high school. We're, we're taking the high school photography student to NASA Goddard Space Center next month, which I can't wait to do. And they're going to be meeting with people there and learning about images, and then they're going to make images. And then we're going to start doing a project on Instagram with them where every month we'll pick a theme and they'll put images, they'll hashtag images seeing science and we'll put them up. But yeah, within one day, right, I've gotten calls from three different schools saying, hey, we want to do something Just with this. Page. So we'll see what happens, right? And is it possible that the website will continue? Because the um, photography uh, changes everything. That site went down. It's That's sort of right. ironic. I mean, not only was it yeah. a book that yeah. kind of became the big deal in the end, but the, the site itself went down. That's the startling so. thing about the web. I mean, the, you know, the photography changes everything is archived on the Internet Archive, but some links don't work and some pictures aren't there, but it's, mm -hmm. it's basically there. But that's like a really interesting thing about doing a web-based project. And it's the idea that this will continue, hopefully, or? This will, it's, you know, this is budgeted out for a year. We said we're going to do the book next year. Um, hopefully it'll go longer. I mean, we've gotten some foundation support, which is nice, and hopefully we'll get some more.
So let's, uh, do we have microphones or are we passing these around? Okay, okay. Yeah. Does, anybody ha does anybody have questions? I'm sure you must have something. Um, Marvin, we, we had talked at one point, I was thinking as you were um, talking now about the, the word photography and what it means, particularly in the context of, of science, because so much um, of what you see sort of generated in the scientific community at this point in time isn't what we traditionally think of as photography, but it's, you know, it's, it's not even lens-based, it's, it's you know, 3D imaging, or it's something that, you know, has linear perspective at its core, but, but isn't photography. And, I'm, and, and I know we had talked once about how inclusive the site is of that, and I'm, maybe I'll throw that out in a public forum to you again. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we're going to have to get there, right? I think that um, this is going to have to take, it's going to have to look at data visualization, right? I mean, photography is useful in the sciences because it shows something, right? And so scientists are looking for the most useful ways of seeing and showing things. And if photography doesn't work, photography goes out the window. But photography is in one form or another, right? Plays, uh, plays a really big role in it. There's some sciences that are less photographic than others. Chemistry, you'll see less images in chemistry than you will in biology. You know, you'll see more and more images in anthropology now than you ever did before because drones flying over anthropological sites with LIDAR laser imaging are like reading through the surface of the earth and uncovering ruins. So I think it keeps changing, but yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna have to deal with it. And the thing that's interesting is that photography was created by scientists. They made this up because they needed it. It's changed because of the sciences, right? We get stuck with eight by 10 paper or 11 by you know, 14 paper or rolls of paper that are a certain thing. Science changes photography to make it whatever it needs to be. So I think the site's got to deal with that. And there's certain places where photography fails. And, there's certain, and, and also scientists, you know, when they're done with their images, they used to just dump them. They didn't cherish any of this stuff. These are all just working tools. So I think those attitudes around imaging are interesting. Is there a place on the site for a dialogue, say, for a scientist to say, see what's happening here? I need some understanding of what observation is, where new input can come in from sources other than your aegis. We haven't planned for that yet, right? I mean, one of my favorite Instagram accounts is called Figure One. Right? You guys know that? Anybody look at that? Figure one is doctors doing that online. They say, hey, look at this, right? What's this, right? And everybody like starts talking about it, which I think is really cool. I, I, I mean, I, frankly, I never thought about that for this website. Could it happen? Yeah. One of the other things we're doing at UMBC, I mean, I spent two years going around on campus talking to research scientists there and, and students there and trying to think how to incorporate their work. So the next thing we're doing that's going to be an add-on to the website is a 3D interactive map that works. Um, it's a program called Map2 that they've developed at UMBC. And basically, you're going to come down you know, with a god's eye view from the sky from, and go to every building on campus. And we're going to ask every faculty member, every student, and every person working on campus to make an image that has something to do with the sciences. And you'll be able to see contemporary imaging being made on a daily basis on the campus. So your idea is a really good one. We haven't thought of it yet, but we might. So one thing that's particularly interesting to me about the project is that there is this uh, photography of science, but there's also the science of photography, um, and it's kind of like actually maybe more of a scientific invention um, than it was an artistic invention, at least in its kind of early days uh, as it was conceived. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering um, how is the site going to address that, and how is that maybe going to, maybe to get back to Oliver's question, think about more kind of contemporary imaging and the science of that? 
Uh, we, the, well, the timeline starts to deal with that, and hopefully we would get people to write about that and talk about that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's what's so interesting about the relationship of them, right? And, and then the other thing that I'm really interested in is how images made in and of the sciences affect legislation, right? Affect law, policy, like, you know, your health insurance, right? I mean, this, the, this thing spreads out in really interesting ways. But yeah, that's a good point, and we would love to get to that yeah. soon. Science and art sometimes share the same discipline of writing and finding way, and then mistakes and finding. Do you see it in your sight, in your work, between artists and scientists, mm -hmm. this relationship? Mm -hmm. Or these mistakes, or the same method that they borrow from each other? Right. Kind of question? I'm just curious to know if you find and saw those correlations. Uh, I mean, you know, you go back, you look at the history of photography, and people have certain, like Anna Atkins, right? I mean, that becomes art, right? And Moybridge is art. And you look at the, uh, the kind of topographic images made in the 1860s in the United States, and like by Carlton Watkins, and those are art. Um, and you see more and more. There's, there's, there's a crossover. There's a, and, and as I said before, I think the people making these images f know they're beautiful. They, they know they're interesting. That's the, that's the other thing. You start looking at these images through another mindset and through another head, you know, and try to understand like what makes these artful or interesting to scientists. And that's where that kind of art photography thing gets really wild when you get scientists altering pictures and then say, then putting them out there as art, right? There's all these articles that I read about, you know, the physicist who fell in love with photography and is now an artist, you know? I mean, so there's people going, you know, there are artists making work about the sciences, and then there are scientists who are like giving up the sciences to be artists, right? I mean, there was one, I just was reading an article this weekend, and it was by this, this uh, she's a theoretical physicist, a woman named Fontiti Markaloo, and she said, Removing the person is the whole point of training as a scientist, but this may or may not be possible. And so she's, you know, she's kind of moved away from being a scientist to being more of an artist. So there's this back and forth. It's like interesting to see. Yeah, go ahead, Charlie. I'm just wondering what, what the what you speculate. And I know this is a big question: the role of the artist in the course of scientific discovery itself. That's a really good one? question. That's a really good question. Um, when I did the Paradise Now show, right, that was like in 2000, and it was the year that the human genome was being decoded, and there was tremendous talk and anxiety about genetically modified foods, and the show, the exhibition represented kind of both sides of it. And the sciences were interested in the show and interested in images because they could run them in science magazines and it could trigger a different kind of dialogue um, there. But the whole time, I kept thinking, what does art about science do, right? And I, the answer is, I'm not so sure. And I, you know, and that's part of why this site puts art in a context, right? It's not about photography and art and science. It's it's about all of it. So. I don't know, but I do know, as I was saying, in terms of things like climate change, right, in terms of medicine, right? I mean, it, the images, well, they're not made by artists necessarily, although some artists have made work that's been become poster imaging for you know, various scientific and political uh, movements. So it can happen. I'm, not, I'm just, it's, it's an interesting thing. And also it's getting these images seen, right? We're gonna be doing a, online event with Michael Shaw, who was here a couple of weeks ago. We're doing a, a salon about, uh, with reading the pictures about science in the media and how the media represents sciences. And that's interesting, too, because it's scientist pictures and it's stock photographs, like the ones Oliver put up of people holding beakers. So uh, you know, in terms of art and sciences, I think you know, what doesn't necessarily happen in the sciences or is not as visible to the large public as a talk about ethics, as a talk about cultural implications around <laughs> science. Um, 
Yeah, and I think that when artists start looking at sciences, I think they start asking those questions and ringing those bells, and I think that's important too, but getting that artwork out into a science community is a very hard thing to do, as is getting science images into art museums. Well, doesn't, doesn't there often need to be a lag? I mean, or, or maybe hasn't it often happened that there's been a lag that when images from science enter art, it, they're often entering kind of as historical images or they're entering after the fact? I mean, Moybridge's images of, yeah, an, human locomotion, were those, those weren't necessarily being seen as art right at the time they were being made, right? right. They were being done, they were, they were sort of in the realm of science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there was, a, you, there was an article I read a couple of months ago that NASA has doubled the number of applications for astronauts' position as they did last time they went out, and they attribute it to Instagram. They attribute it to NASA's Instagram accounts, which are hugely popular and beautiful. So yeah, there is there's definitely that. I mean, look at TV, look at the drug commercials, right? I mean, drug advertising is a big part of this also, you know. Turn on, turn on the evening news and, you know, watch, you know, commercials for, you know, every kind of disease under the sun where, you know, smiling senior citizens, right, are like popping, you know, pills that it costs $2,000 a piece, right? And they've got to make imaging to sell the stuff. So, yeah, so it's, 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 it's very much about that. And it's also very much about getting government and legislators to fund projects. You get potholes filled, right, by showing photographs of potholes to people. And I think you get rockets built. I mean, look at all the stuff going around uh, online and, and the news about Elon Musk and the, the Mars launches and spaceships. That's like masterful marketing, and it's based on imaging. From an education perspective, I think that um, science in primary schools is still not taught as a creative endeavor. And it looks like your website is more focused towards an adult audience, but you're doing outreach to high schools and kids. Is there any thought of making the seeing science to a more kid-friendly audience? We'd love to. We'd love to. I mean, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of me and this intern, right? And so there's someone at the CADVAC, the Center for Art, Design, and Visual Culture, who does educational outreach and will work with someone in the education department at UMBC and do it, but yeah, I would love to do it on, on those levels. When we did Photography Changes Everything, we did some projects with some schools. One of my, uh, actually one of my former students from here, right? Her sister was the language arts uh, head of the Lincoln, Nebraska school system. So she did a um, an exercise about using photographs to teach kids about truth and fiction, right? And look at pictures and decide what was real and what wasn't real. And in that case, it was, yeah, it was, it was, we were working on K through 12 and we were doing things along the way. We would love to do it. And that's my hope, that this kind of leads to a dialogue that leads to other kinds of opportunities. And it's, um, that's also why this is more fun than just doing an exhibition. You do an exhibition, it's on the wall, it happens. Maybe there's a book, maybe it lives online in some way. This kind of grows, and it's hard to tell where it's going to go to, which is what's interesting about it. So yeah, we would love to have. I mean, that's we want to get like you know five-year-olds out making pictures about you know what's what's science in their life. Sure. Way in the back. Thanks. Sorry for the wait. Um, I think the idea behind truth and objectivity in science versus photography is really interesting. I mean, I've worked as a scientist and I've created images as a scientist. And the manipulation of data isn't just 20, 15, 20 years ago. It's ongoing. It's still going. And people's lives, careers, policy decisions, et cetera, are affected by it. You know, retractions of papers, um, loss of data that was untruthful, and scientists' careers affected by it. But in terms of those kind of images, the ones that scientists consider as data, how much do you think the aesthetics of the image being read by the public is important versus the actual ability to read that image and know what it is? Um, let's think of the classic example of Rosalind Franklin's image. 
I, I think that there are multiple audiences for images, and I think people are mindful about what goes out there. You know, I think about the Hubble pictures again, and uh, in this salon that we're going to be doing in December, uh, the panel is going to include somebody from the Hubble Heritage Project, right? And um, they're very conscious of this going out to the public, right? And they're very aware that scientists are going to read those images differently or use aspects of them differently. So I think the same way that everybody's involved in public relations in their, uh, their lives in one way or the other, so are scientists. And so I think that um, those kind of issues are ones that people sort out, you know? And I guess, I guess there's... Well, I mean, you know, I read online, I read stories about people who get hauled on the carpet, you know, for, for not correctly describing what they're doing or not doing to images. So I think those, those, it depends on the audience, it depends on what the, how the audience is trained to read images, it depends on what communicates an idea clearly to an audience that you want it to communicate to. I think it's a, I think that's something that'll get worked out along the way. But again, that speaks to the flexibility of photographic imaging. And so the Hubble pictures are operatic in the scale that they operate in. You know, and they're very, very different than medical medical images. You know, I mean, what's also changed is so much this idea that the public has a has a voice or has an opinion or because I mean, for so much of the 19th and 20th century, science and even photography was treated as a more or less specialist. Medium. I mean, when I was growing up, right, scientists were off in some corner over there, and you didn't really know what they did, or the ability to understand. I mean, you pick up a Scientific American magazine, and there was really, you almost needed a translator to help you figure out what it was all about. I mean, now when, you know, you have this project and the possibility of um, a kind of a mass audience, a non-specifically a non scientific audience, learning about and accessing it and having ideas about it and how resources, as you say, are spent and how this information is being communicated. Um, it seems like we're in a world that's not unlike, I don't know, the way social media has infiltrated politics or, you know, crime or whatever, things that are going on in the street, right? It's like this is the beginning, maybe, of a wave of a kind of, uh, what, larger gathering of audience as participants. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it is because more people make images and they're spread widely, but if you go back into the history of science photography in the 1880s or so, they were crowdsourcing uh, pictures when people were studying extreme weather conditions, right? It, it would happen in, it happened in Britain, certainly, you know, people were studying tornadoes and storms and they would go out to the public and they would say, send us pictures, right? And this became, and, and science news was front page news in the 1880s and 1890s. So I think it kind of comes and goes, you know, and I think, that um, depending on how media works, um, science imaging can kind of get buried away in a science section, but more and more science is kind of news and part of everybody's lives. Again. No, we have it. No, you're good, Charlie. It seems to me that that's the word that connects all of this, that we've sort of, in the art world or community that exists, and we're the creative people, and we don't think of science in quite in that way, though, obviously, it's a great piece of creative energy that any given science or group of scientists do. And the connection is to put the value, I think, on creativity rather than on differentiation between one dif discipline and another. I mean, the discovery is the issue and uh, leading us to new revelations no matter what. And I think that that's happened because of the social media, because of everybody's participation and our ability to view science in a new way. You know, just we have more access to it in some ways, not to the particulars, but to the bigger issues. Just an observation. Mm -hmm. Well, also the idea of seeing and knowing. I mean, I think that's a big part of this project. I mean, the fact that it's called seeing science, it's sort of seeing, you know, using images more or less, I mean, with some text obviously attached to them, but 
seeing, having images as the gateway to knowledge is uh, uh, maybe more of a factor nowadays than, I mean, I don't know, or in a different, is, has the world shifted in some respect in that regard? No, I, I mean, I think the sciences were always visual. That's why photography's got such a huge impact on it. I mean, it was the huge facilitating tool and causes science to move um, faster, right? Much, much faster. But it is called, it is seeing science, and we did keep that. It's an interesting thing to be doing this at a science research university. This school, UMBC, is heavy science, right? And it, it, you're kind of right. This is a picture-based um, examination of this. And that will be an interesting thing, too, to see what can happen from this. You know, for instance, in the mini exhibitions where we're doing this, I'm writing 150 words about each artist, right? You could write, you know, essays about all of them. But really, the idea is to get people used to looking and being uh, curious. So any other questions out there? Um, before we say thank you to Marvin, I think we should just point out again that this was Oliver Wasso over here, and he is the one who's going to be doing the talk with Marvin on December 1st, is it? Uh, I think it's, it's the day after uh, Election Day. Oh, November, oh, oh, oh no, no, I'm sorry, November 9th, November 9th, November 9th. Um, okay, thanks a lot, Marvin. Thank you. Yep, thank, thank you all for coming. Welcome everybody, students, faculty, outsider, artists, communicators, whatever you be, husbands, wives, mistresses, lovers, thank you for coming. Um, this is the second of a whole series of events that we're now holding in our new space for those of you who haven't seen it. We call it the big room. Um, it is a place that we gather for discussion, talk, feedback about the nature of the lens and screen arts, and uh, a place that we're opening up to all kinds of public use and other, other people who want to do things here. So please enjoy it. We, this is the largest crowd we've had yet, and we have a few little kinks probably, so bear with us. It just got finished literally last week in terms of all of its operations. Um, this event is being live streamed all over the world. <laughs> it is a major event and in cooperation with other institutions, which Marvin will tell you about. And it is available through our website in the future if you're somewhere else and you want to tune in, so do so. Twitter and Facebook-based project updated daily called Why We Look, which is actually also on the Seeing Science website, which tracks breaking news stories about imaging and visual culture. Um, before getting into Seeing Science, I've asked Marvin to, to give us a quick tour through his own professional background and history, to give us a sense of the ideas and institutional forms and formats that led up to Seeing Science. Please uh, welcome Marvin. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, some of you know me, some of you don't. So you, some of the slides that you'll see may be of things that you've seen before. So bear with me if that's the case. But I um, just wanted to walk you through a little bit of history of some curatorial projects that I did that kind of set the current projects I'm doing now. Anyway, the Smithsonian thing, the gig, stopped, right? I mean, they, the photography initiative got folded into another part of the Smithsonian and I was kind of cut loose. And at that point, I had also done a blog for the Smithsonian and gotten used to having a kind of pulpit and a place to talk about imaging from an audience. And so I started this Why We Look project, which uh, every day, basically, at the end of every day, I spent about 45 minutes looking around on the web for stories about photography. At any rate, uh, I'm happy to have two of my dear colleagues, friends, and compatriots here at the table. I'm being Charlie Rose now. 
And uh, I'll just give a little bit of an introduction. Marvin is one of the founding members of this faculty, now 27 years here, and known as a curator, writer, thinker, interlocutor, creative person in our field, uh, longstanding, and uh, at 39, he's done an awful lot. So then Steele, who's going to be our interlocutor tonight, is also an artist, faculty member. How many years have you been here? Eight? I don't think Close. Getting there. And uh, teaches one of our thesis classes and is a writer, creator, artist, photographer, and he is an editor of Art in America. So with no further ado, well, a contributing editor, but a regular contributing editor. That makes you an editor. So here. Thank you both. Thank you, Charlie. If I put this back in here, then I won't have to think about it again. Can you hear me? Yep, hopefully live in a world that is a result of their union. Marvin is an independent curator and writer, as Charlie said. He organizes projects about photography and visual culture for institutions that include the Museum of Modern Art, the Smithsonian Institution, the International Center of Photography, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Carnegie Museum of Art, and the New Museum. Earlier in his career as a gallerist and artist representative, notably at Castelli Graphics, which I think is where we first met. Um, Marvin worked closely with many artists and photographers, including, among others, Robert Adams, Eve Arnold, Louis Baltz, Nan Golden, Peter Hujar, and Richard Prince. He has written essays for many museum and gallery catalogs, as well as for publications and blogs that include the New York Times, CNN, Art Forum, Design Observer, Aperture, Art in America, and Bomb. He is the author of over two dozen books on photography and visual culture, including Photography Changes Everything, published by Aperture in 2012, which also began like Seeing Science um, as a web project and was, in a sense, its precursor. He's a visiting scholar at the Center for Art, Design, and Visual Culture at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, a core faculty member in the ICP BARD MFA program in Advanced Photographic Studies, and on the faculty here at SVA. Marvin also has an ongoing um, Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction, and then actually Marvin is going to do a lot of this, a lot of the work today. Um, I'm just going to um, stage manage or something. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit of an intro that I have. Um, so we're here today with Marvin Heiferman, who most of you know, who is going to introduce us to his new project, Seeing Science which launched as a website last month under the auspices of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. It will ultimately also become a book. Seeing Science explores the parallel histories and uses of science and photography. It focuses on the central and evolving role that photography and lens-based technologies play in defining, shaping, promoting, and furthering science, as well as on how images made in and about the sciences impact public opinion and policy science education, and the news. Wonderful coincidences that Marvin discovered in his research is that the word scientist was first coined in 1834. Incredible as that, that sounds. Certainly science as a word must have been around a lot, a lot, uh, a lot longer than that. Um, but scientist was first coined in 1834, just five years before the word photography itself was first publicly recorded. Indeed, science and photography have developed so inextricably in the modern era that it seems almost too obvious to say that we now 